exciting stuff. Who has been enjoying the Olympics? I have been. I've probably watched more television in the last nine days than I have done for the last two years of my life, something like that. And uh, last night, uh, uh, Joanna and I decided we'd have an early night because uh, our little girl Amelia had actually gone to sleep and she hasn't been asleep much over the last couple of weeks. Um, but then we found ourselves just sucked into the gold rush that it was last night, and so we went to bed late. I, of course, have got caught up in the, the, the kind of buzz for fitness that it uh, inspires. It's not just inspiring the next generation. I am this generation, and I'm being inspired too. Uh, and so I, I have run three times this week, and I am in agony. I really am. So pray for my body as I talk to you tonight. Um, so something we are all enjoying, and of course every church in the land is doing a series on spiritual fitness, but it is, like I said, a really important uh, image, um, a key metaphor uh, in the Bible. The Bible talks about spiritual health or spiritual fitness. And so the question that I want to ask you right at the start, uh, as we look at this passage in Philippians together, is are you spiritually fit? Are you spiritually fit? What do you think? Are you spiritually fit? So why don't you uh, flick open if you've closed your Bible to Philippians 3, uh, 12 and 14, and we're going to have a look at it. I think it's page 1115 in your Bibles. Last week in this series, uh, Ed uh, looked at 1 Corinthians 9 and talked about um, what it means to run to win. And he looked at the race uh, he looked at the prize and the crown. And then uh, in the evening, Darren said something that for me was really interesting and has stuck with me the whole week. He said that exercise is not the same thing as training. Hmm. It gives you food for thought. Exercise is not the same thing as training. I thought, Darren, he's a very clever man. And then somebody said to me today, no, no, he nicked that from John Ortberg. <laughs> I don't know if you did. But... Maybe he's a clever man and you're a clever man too. But I thought it was a good point. Exercise is not the same as training. Training has a goal. You're, you are training for something. It made me realize the last thing I trained for was uh, American football at the age of 18. So I haven't trained for quite some time. So a second question for you is what is the goal of your spiritual life? What's the goal of your spiritual life? Are you in training, spiritual training? As Paul says, are you training yourself in righteousness or are you just keeping fit, exercising now and then? This week, we're looking at, uh, we're calling it to the limit, to the limit. And it's all about maximizing your potential. How can you achieve your personal best in your spiritual life, in your Christian walk with the Lord. I have particularly got caught up in the cycling, in the velodrome uh, for th this Olympics. I love cycling. I have a fixed gear bike, uh, so I enjoy riding it. Um, and it has been amazing to me to see how Team GB has completely uh, dominated the sport. And it's been like that for five, ten years or so. It didn't used to be like that. What happened? What has changed that has meant that a sport where uh, very few people pursued it as a discipline to one where it's become incredibly popular and then where we have become simply the best? Uh, as uh, one of the BBC commentators said today, the way it goes in the velodrome is uh, we race, we meet, we race, and we win gold. I thought, well, fair enough. Usually the world record as well. The difference was made with the appointment of a coach, a guy called uh, David Brailsford. He's actually the coach for uh, Team GB, but also for Skyride. So he has won us countless gold medals. He also won us the Tour de France with Bradley Wiggins. Uh, and he's in great demand. As a, he's actually, his title is the performance manager, I think, or performance director, rather. And he's in great demand all over the world. And he has a very simple philosophy as a coach. And so I want you to remember this if you can. It's not the catchiest philosophy in the world, but you should be able to remember it. And this is what he says uh, shapes all that he does as a coach, a successful coach. He talks about the aggregation of marginal gains. 
I told you it wasn't that catchy, but can you remember that? The aggregation of marginal gains. So what he does is he looks at every aspect of the cyclist's life, his nutrition, his diet, uh, his sleep patterns, his rest, uh, the practice and fitness of the rider, his kit, his equipment, the tactics he uses during the race. And this is what he says. It means taking the 1% from everything you do, finding a 1% margin for improvement in everything you do. That's what we try to do from the mechanics upwards. If a mechanic sticks a tire on and someone comes along and says it could be done better, it's not an insult. It's because we are always striving for improvement for those 1% gains in absolutely every single thing we do. It's amazing, isn't it? 1%, a marginal gain, but as, as you aggregate those marginal gains together, you get a gold rush. The coach makes all the difference. And Paul here is acting as the spiritual coach for the Philippians. He wants to help them get the most out of their souls. And so he says to them, imitate me. Look at my life, put into practice what I'm doing, and you will bear spiritual fruit. You'll be spiritually fit. And he doesn't just say that to the Philippians, he says that to us as well. And he doesn't just say, I am your spiritual coach. He also says, I want you to be spiritual coaches of others. And this is something, I'm just warning you, giving you a little heads up here, you'll be hearing much more of as we move into 2013. Because we want every one of us here to be the coach of someone else. We want everybody to be an apprentice and a coach. So who are you apprenticing? Who's your athlete? Who are you investing in? Who are you helping to make those marginal gains? And can you say to them, you imitate me and you will get spiritually fit? I find that one of the most challenging uh, phrases that Paul uses in the whole New Testament. So how, though, if we are called to be coaches, if we're receiving coaching from Paul, how can we take others to to the limit? How can we take ourselves to the limit? Well, I think Paul offers us three tools that we can apply to ourselves and then use as we seek to coach others. And they are these, focus, posture, and motivation. So let's begin with posture. Look at verse 13. Uh, Paul says there, uh, but one thing I do. One thing I do. Every athlete needs a focus. They need a purpose to live for, an intention, a goal to strive towards, something to aim for. It concentrates the mind, focuses the attention. It means you don't need to worry about what the competition is doing. You have your goal, your aim, you're heading straight for it. You look to, neither to the right nor to the left. You don't compare yourself with others. You're not distracted by others. Victoria Pendleton, just after she had won the gold medal in the Kerin, uh, she was being interviewed by the BBC, and she said, my coach said to me, don't worry about anybody else, what they're doing, just run your race. Keep your eye on the prize. Be focused on the one thing. Don't be distracted by the competition. And don't dwell on the past. Paul says, forgetting what is behind in verse 13. Don't look over your shoulder. That's a recipe for failure. Don't dwell on past mistakes, past failures. But also don't dwell on past successes. Don't rest on your laurels. Don't think, wow, I had an amazing encounter with God 10 years ago, and I'm still living off that moment. That's a sad way to live the Christian life, isn't it? Stay hungry. Keep pressing on and pressing in. There's that famous scene, isn't there, in uh, the movie Chariots of Fire. The theme tune has been played in every medal ceremony in the Olympics. And uh, it's in the qualifying race, and Eric Little uh, is, um, is running. And just as he goes around the first bend, somebody purposefully trips him up, and he crashes out of the race. And his coach is there, and he just says to himself, get up, man. Come on. 
get up, man. And Eric could have laid there and just thought how unfair life was, how outrageous some people were. But instead, he picks himself up and he starts to chase down the other runners. And as he goes, he does his thing, his head's down, he picks up speed, he goes past the runners, and then his head goes back, and he wins the race. He chose to remain focused, not to worry about the competition, not to dwell on the past, and he won the race. That was his goal. But what is Paul's goal? What's the goal that Paul is pursuing? You see, because uh, we can have all the focus we need, but we can be focused in the wrong direction. We can be focused on the wrong thing. And you see here, Paul articulates his goal in verses 7 to 11. Just have a look at it with me. And what you see there is that his goal is not heaven. For Paul, it's not about getting to heaven. His goal is not about spiritual power or spiritual experience. Those things don't matter to him. It's not about even the kingdom of God. Look at what he says in verse 8. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. That's what it's about for Paul. That's all he wants. It is simple. It is clear. That is his focus, to gain Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. And that means knowing Christ. It means communion with him. And it means imitating Christ, being transparent to his work in our hearts. That's his focus And so you need to know your goal, and then you need to pursue it with all the energy that you can muster. So that's the first thing, focus. The second thing is posture. Again, look down at verse 13. Paul says, One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. You see, spiritual fitness requires effort. The posture that Paul is talking about here is not lying on his back with his arms behind his head and his legs crossed, yawning. The posture is of the athlete reaching for the line, stretching out to cross the line first with straining every sinew, every fiber of his being, every muscle is tensed to get the most out of his performance. So he says in verse 12, I press on to take hold. Paul is tenacious. He is obsessive. The language there of taking hold is is the same word that they use for, for persecution. It's going after somebody. It's grasping. It's seizing. It's it's hunting down your prize, your goal. So when Ben Ainsley was... Uh, felt that two of his competitors had really cheated by saying that he'd hit the boy when really he hadn't. I don't know if you saw the interview. It was quite funny. He just said, he's made me angry. He shouldn't have done that. And then he hunted him down. The race before the medal race. He knew he had to push him back. And so he got so far out in front. He could have just kept sailing, but he didn't do that. He thought, I'm going to get that Danish guy. And he turned around and he hunted him down and he ensured that he would win the gold. He took hold of his goal. He chased him down. And And that's what Paul is calling us to, to make the tackle, to take the line. You see, the Christian life, it's not a stroll, it's not a walk in the park. So how do you have that posture where you're taught and ready without pulling a muscle, without burning out? Well, you've got to know the condition you're in right now. How spiritually fit are you? I was, uh, yeah, I remember a time when I was uh, in, uh, just started theological college in Oxford, and uh, it was great, because it was like being a student again, and uh, so first week, it's like, football, brilliant, I can get fit, that's amazing, so I tried out with the Wycliffe Hall football team, 
And uh, the next day, it was horrible. My body was a wreck. And we, we sat down, and, and I wasn't alone. There were about 20 of us in there who could barely move. And we sat in this lecture room for our induction. And one of the tutors gets up and she says, now, guys, I just want to say, be careful when you play football. Because you're not 18 anymore. You're now 30-something. And your body can't do what it used to be able to do when you were last at university. And we all sat there like, I wish you'd taught us that yesterday, because we can't move. It was horrendous, but it was funny. Same thing happened to, uh, I can't say his name, LaShawn Merritt. I don't know if you you saw him pull up in the 400 meters a few days ago. Uh, He had uh, had an injury. Uh, I think it was in his ankle. And he uh, had done it quite some time ago, and he had had countless hours of therapy uh, trying to sort this injury out from all day long, every day, he had been having um, a physio. But it didn't work. And so he, he was there in the race, he ran off, and he just couldn't get into his stride. It, what, he knew he would injure himself if he pushed himself any further, so he just slowed down and withdrew from the race. And he said this, once I got on the back straight, I felt it. I'm going to rest it, he said, and get ready for the world championship next year. He knew the condition that he was in. And Paul knows how fit, spiritually fit he is. Look at verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal. He knows that the race has not been run. He knows that his goal has not been achieved. He knows that his prize has not been won. And I wonder, do you know how spiritually fit you are? Do you know that you've not yet arrived, that you've not yet reached your destination? Have you made an honest evaluation this week of where you are with God? Have you calculated your strengths and your weaknesses, uh, those areas of spiritual vulnerability where temptation can break in? And it's important when you're doing that to make sure that you make the right evaluation, to use the right indicators. You see, Paul has changed his spiritual indicators. And he says that again in verses 7 to 11. He says, I used to be a Pharisee. And so my spiritual indicators were a heritage. I was an Israelite. I was Jewish. I was a Pharisee. And... uh, Another was passion. I was zealous. I was committed to my religion. I persecuted the church. And then he says, I kept all the rules. I knew I was, I thought I was spiritually fit because I was a legalist. I kept the law. And, but now he says, I realize that all of those things are rubbish. They were the wrong indicators. They gave me a wrong sense of spiritual fitness. I wasn't fit at all. And now he realizes that he has to evaluate his fitness in light of his goal. And his goal is gaining Christ. And so all of those things that were once gains, he now considers loss. He considers them to be rubbish. And he realizes that he has to evaluate himself based upon His relationship with Jesus, intimacy with Jesus, that's what it was about for Paul and nothing else. So we've looked at focus and we've said you've got to know your goal and when you do, pursue it passionately. We've looked at posture and we've said, uh, you know, we ought not to be kind of lying back or coasting in our Christian life, but straining forward, pressing on as a good athlete. And to do that with burning, without burning out, we need to know, actually, how fit am I now? But thirdly, there is motivation. How can we move from being where we are to where we need to be? Well, Paul gives us two really interesting motivations. Look at verse 12. He says, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. 
And then flick down to uh, verse 14. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You see, for Paul, getting spiritually fit is good fun. He enjoys himself. Yes, the Christian life is hard work. It takes effort, but it's not drudgery. It's not a dreary, thankless chore. Paul enjoys his faith, so he can talk about abundant life. He can talk about a full life. He can talk about ultimate joy. It's not unreasonable to say that Paul was a Christian hedonist. He just didn't settle for the second best that we so often do. He knew that he found his satisfaction in God, and so he wanted to take hold of Christ. The the picture uh, he uses there, that, that phrase, take hold, it can also encompass this idea of overtaking. So Paul knew the joy of, of overtaking those in the race. You know, that slow motion moment where you go past them. Anybody runners, any runners here? How many of you have to go past the person in front of you? Darren, I knew you would. <laughs> it's a joy, isn't it, when you do that? Yeah, usually people go past me, and I know I'm giving them joy uh, as they go past. But once in a while, I experience that joy. And that's what Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 2. He says, verse 17, Even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. But how? How does he do that? How does he remain full of joy, even in those moments where it's bucketing it down, it's early morning, and he's out training again to keep spiritually fit? How does he do it? Well, it's because Paul expects to reach his goal. He expects to win the prize. He's confident of success. You see, he's not motivated by anxiety or fear or a sense of panic. He's not at all insecure. And that's because, for Paul, the result is not based on his performance. Do you get that? The result is not based on his performance. And that's where the metaphor of spiritual fitness begins to break down. You see, Paul is confident because God has called him. Verse 14, it's this upward call, this call heavenward. That was actually... uh, Uh, taken from uh, the games in in the first century there where the athlete who had won the race, they would be called upward by the local dignitary, the governor, if it was uh, the Olympic Games, by the emperor. They would be brought up onto the stage and they would receive their laurel wreath. And so what Paul is saying here is, uh, this is your medal ceremony. And the remarkable thing is, is that you're given your medal, you're given your gold medal before you have run the race, before you have competed and won the prize. And that's because God makes you alive in the first place. You have, the the fitness you have is already because of what God has done for you. And that's why Paul says right at the beginning of his letter to the Philippians, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So he's confident because God has called him. And then he's confident, verse 12, because Jesus has already run the race. Look at it again, verse 12. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. You see, Jesus took the initiative with Paul. He broke into his life. He knocked him off his horse and he met him on the road to Damascus. And he does that with every one of us. He reaches out to find us, to meet with us. If we're scrabbling around in the dark trying to find him, we will never find him. But he comes looking for us. It has always been that way with God. And and this verb of taking hold, it's an intense verb. So Jesus overtakes Paul. He grasps him firmly. He captures him. He arrests him. And Paul realized that Jesus has done it all. You see, everything that needs to be done to make us right with God, he has done already. 
Everything that we cannot do for ourselves, he has done already. Jesus, he is the athlete. And we're just getting a ride on his shoulders. And that's why Paul says in verse 9 here that his righteousness is a gift. It's something he's received from God. And his effort, his training, it's a result of the gift that he's already received. The gift is not the result of his effort. If you think like that, you're into legalism and religion. It's got nothing to do with the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. What we're talking about tonight is grace-driven effort. We have already received the medal so we can run the race with confidence. So we've looked at focus, know your goal, pursue it passionately. We've looked at posture, make sure that you are straining forward, not simply coasting, and ensure that you know how fit you are so that you don't burn out. And we've looked at motivation. You can enjoy the spiritual life because you can be confident, because you already have the medal, and because Jesus has already done it. It means you really can run the race. You can do it. So Paul here is acting as our spiritual fitness coach, and he's giving us tools so that we can uh, become spiritually fit and then teach others how they can be spiritually fit too. Paul here is explaining those marginal gains. So where's the 1% that you can improve? Is it In your focus, do you need to sharpen your focus just a little bit to get back to the reality that it's all about gaining Christ? It's all about intimacy with Christ. Train for it if that's where you are. Is it about improving your posture? Do you realize that uh, you've just begun to take it easy and you need to pick up the pace? And you need to make sure you don't pull a muscle so you need a spiritual audit? Or perhaps you need to rediscover the right motivation, that you have been uh, striving in order to win the prize. And you need to realize once again that Jesus has already run the race and has won the prize on your behalf. I wonder which one of those it is for you. And what Paul says effectively to all of us is you can do this. This isn't for the elite athletes, the super fit. It's for every one of us. And so he says, go for it. And those words of the great sponsor of all things uh, sporting, Nike, just do it. Let me pray. 